We'll wait uh, one more minute and then we go. Okay, I think we can uh, start. Uh, welcome everyone. Uh, because of some technical difficulties, uh, Pierre here is uh, Iron Trotter, but I am uh, Maxi San Miguel from the Institute of uh, Cross Disciplinary Physics and Complex Physics and, and Complex Systems in uh, Mallorca, in Spain. Uh, this webinar has been organized by the Institute of Physics and it is about uh, a focus issue on the, the journal of physics complexity on the subject of uh, complex systems approaches to information processing. Uh, the uh, guest editors of these uh, focus issues are my colleagues um, Ingo Fischer and Claudio Mirasso here, also from uh, my same institute and, um, and myself. Now, the idea of this uh, webinar is not only to highlight some of, the, some of the contributions to this focus issue, but also to promote uh, some discussion on the general ideas and, uh, and the uh, future trends of this uh, research topic. For this purpose, we will have a roundtable discussion after the uh, presentation by our, uh, by our speakers. Uh, I thank those speakers, uh, Caroline Weisner, Hiva Stahl, uh, Mark Time, Daniel Gautier and Roberta Zambrini for being here today. And before going into that, I give the screen to Ginestra Bianconi, uh, Editor-in-Chief of the Journal of Physics Complexity, uh, to say a few words. Yes, thank you, Maxi. It's a great pleasure as an Editor-in-Chief of JFIS Complexity to host uh, this webinar on complex system approach to information processing. And of course, the chair is our Maxi San Miguel, Claudio Mirasso, and the Fisher. And here you see the wonderful lineup of uh, speakers that uh, we have invited today. So let me say a few words about the journal. So JFIS Complexity is a new multidisciplinary and open access journal publishing the most exciting and significant um, discovery of, across all area of complex systems and networks. And we are now publishing the third uh, issue. And uh, it is uh, my pleasure to tell you that uh, the journal doesn't charge any author fee for publications submitted in 2022, while if you uh, submit a paper to the journal, you will benefit from uh, open access uh, uh, venue and uh, so I really suggest you to um, submit your eye impact research to to this uh, exciting new journal and um, the scope of the journal is quite broad of course we are interested in problem related to information theory and, uh, and processing uh, but uh, the subject coverage is quite wide, ranging for artificial intelligence to uh, biological application, economics, and, uh, and even uh, quantum information and quantum networks. So without further ado, I leave the floor to, um, to Claudio to present the, wors the workshop and the talk. Well, thank you very much. Uh, do you see my presentation? Right now. Okay. The, the I, idea is to present briefly what we I think you need to put the show. Sure. I need to what? To, I should be in the mode presentation now. No? So far we see only white screen. No. I because think if you... this is just like... sure. if I put what, sorry. I, I think you should uh, well, click I... on show. Or is, is a white screen now? It's a white screen. Yeah, I see I see that now. Why why I see that I see that you don't see it, but I I'm seeing my presentation here. I'm sharing the, my, the, the PowerPoint presentation. Okay, now, now, now it comes. Yeah. 
Now it comes. It just takes now it comes. Well, maybe a delay. Yeah. So sorry yeah, for no, that. No, uh, no, no. Probably the... we don't see. We see the presentation, but not full screen. Well, that I put it in full screen. So I'm sorry if you don't see that. But uh, let me just tell you because if not, we are going to delay too much. I hope you can see at least a little. If the idea is just to introduce quickly who we are and, and, and the editors of this focus issue that Maxi already mentioned. So, so we are a member of the Institute for Cross Disciplinary Physics and Complex System, an institution created, a center created in 2007 as a joint research institute between the University of the Balearic Islands and the Spanish National Research Council. And uh, our aim is to, our mission is to develop cross disciplinary and strategic research in complex systems following physics approaches. Uh, since 2007, we are working in brain inspired computing using, using complex systems and started in our focus uh, European project in 2010-2012, which we coordinated from FISC. And that uh, its main outcome was the open of the field, which is known as delay based reservoir computing and its applications in photonics and auto electronic hardware. Uh, in 2018, we received the Center of Excellence or the Unit of Excellence Award from the Spanish government. And uh, we are the only of the 22 uh, accredited uh, units, the only one in complex system. This uh, accreditation, which contains uh, some money as well, allowed us to grow about 30% since uh, 2018. And the, the topic of, the, of our uh, unit of, uh, unit of excellence is the information processing in and by complex system covering up the aspect of biological system, brain inspired computing in photonics and electronics, information processing in socio-technical system, and also in quantum systems. Uh, the research has been an umbrella for the activities of the entire institute, defining a strategic plan and focusing our research of the center in the period 2018-2022. So the topics has nowadays been finding rapidly growing attention due to many reasons, in particular aspect of information theory and information processing as a fundamental approach of complex system. There is an interest in exploring novel functionalities of complex system, the rise of machine learning and artificial intelligence and the desire to understand the process of how they work. There is a focus on the information processing in brain and brain inspired computing. And there is also an urgent need for more efficient and hardware uh, efficient computing systems. And uh, uh, also the development of new or novel computational concepts, for instance, in quantum reservoir computing. From the application point of view, there are challenges and advances in robotics and conventional computing, neuromorphic computing, optimization processing system, biology, and more. And this was the motivation for the special issue that we have today. Thank you very much for everybody, and, and, and I leave it back to Maxi. Uh, thanks very much, uh, and Claudio, to explain us the uh, motivation. And now we go ahead with our, uh, <coughs> with our uh, presentations. Our first speaker is uh, Caroline Wiesner, which is Professor of Complexity Science at the University of Potsdam in Germany, and also member of the Center for Science and Philosophy of the University of Bristol. Caroline has been working on different aspects of information theory in the context of complex systems, as well as in the general concepts of what we understand by complex systems. Uh, the screen is yours, uh, Caroline. Thank you very much, Maxi, and thank you everyone for, for joining us here. In this paper that my colleague James Ladyman and I contributed to the special issue, we chose a, a somewhat provocative title, and uh, the title is shown here, Complex Systems Are Always Correlated, Rarely Information Processing. So the first part of this title, I think, is completely uncontroversial. Complex systems are always correlated. The second part, we put it in a somewhat provocative style because we want to make sure that, or we want to emphasize that it's important to distinguish between these two aspects of complex systems, correlation versus information. And uh, I think it's important to do that, not only because you know, philosophers and physicists, I think, should be very precise in their statements, but also, if we want to use complex systems as information processor, which a lot of my co-authors in, in this special issue do, um, then 
I think we should start with asking in what sense is a complex system per se really information processing? <clears throat> So I'm showing you a few images uh, which are chosen somewhat randomly, uh, images of complex systems. They're chosen for their visual beauty, really. And what you see is um, correlation in space, structure. So the, the black and white image in, in the background is, is uh, cellular organisms that are just, I mean, stunning beauty, really. Um, and it's, it's the result of a, a process of self-organization. Now, self-organization and information processing is often mentioned together, but they are not the same thing. These systems here, like the cellular organisms in the background, the, the shell in, on the upper right corner and the broccoli in the lower right corner, are complex systems. And the uh, correlation is a result of self-organization and not, we argue, the result of information processing. So what exactly is the difference in our view between these two things? On this image, I show you a complex system which is information processing. Uh, I'm showing you a beehive which looks fantastically chaotic and it is in some sense, but it's also very organized in another sense. Um, as we know, social um, colonies have fabulous structure uh, rules to which they adhere and one of these structures that they have is that they communicate to one another the location and also the quality of for example of nest sites food sites and, and nest sites and how does that communication take place that communication takes place in the form of a dance which i'm sure you've all heard of and bees communicate the location and the quality encoded in the movement so for example when they think a particular nest site is of very high quality they repeat a certain sequence many many times now why is that information processing or certainly uh, information communication because it's a symbolic representation right it's a symbolic representation because something like the quality is rep represented through something differently which is the repetition frequency for example so the difference between these two sets of complex systems which i've shown you here is that the letter on the beehive example is actually information processing in the following sense if you ask a computer scientist uh, what is information processing then they will tell you um, first of all the information that is being processed is encoded symbolically and of course, that's true for all the computational machinery we use uh, as humans in our daily lives. But there are complex systems in nature that use symbolic encoding. The beehive is one example. And another prime example, of course, is, is DNA encoding of, of protein synthesis and protein structure. And secondly, the computation needs to be independent of the architecture. And so even if we argue that maybe structure is something symbolic, um, the computation in the formation of, for example, cellular structure is never independent of the architecture. It has to take place in that particular molecular context. Um, otherwise, it doesn't work. So you see, I'm not saying that I'm, I'm telling you anything new, but my, my aim is to really sort these different um, concepts, bring them in the right place, and then we can start asking, well, when we have a, uh, an information processing system, can we then harness that information processing for our own purposes? So I'll show you two examples of work which uh, is, is, is really fascinating. Um, I'm, though, slightly misusing these uh, to show you that considering complex systems as information processing can be tempting but it's not always accurate the first example is um, a, a group that models so they they take uh, electrochemical signals in the heart they model the heart as a network and then they they represent the whole so the network of these signals as uh, a communication network and you see in the upper left hand corner you see this this um, 
this standard diagram of a communication channel as Claude Shannon initially invented it. Um, so in their view, they say the heart is a communication system and as such it is more complex than the traditional concept of sharing electrical information via gap junctions. Now, the question that one can ask here, if even if this is not an information processing system in the sense that I've just said, can we learn something about the system by taking on this point of view? Um, and that's, that's a question that one can discuss, um, certainly. The second example is the universe. It's, it's quite popular, especially among physicists, to, to report that the universe is a, an information processing system. One of the proponents of that point of view is Seth Lloyd, whose work I respect enormously. Uh, in this particular point of view, I, I disagree with him. So he writes in this essay, The Computational Universe, the very first information processing revolution began with the beginning of the universe itself. Each of these particles carried with it bits of information, and every time two particles bounced off each other, those bits were transformed and processed. Now, the universe is not implementing symbolic encoding, I think, and it is uh, any computation is not independent of the architecture. But that doesn't prevent us, of course, from taking these systems and imposing a, a symbolism onto, say, particles um, and using them for computation, which, which there are some great examples for, for doing that or following that line of research in, in the focus issue. So why, why if, if information processing is for many systems in nature not actually present, but the tool of information theory is very popular among complexity scientists. Not least because we want to use a complex system as a computer, but for other reasons as well. And that's something that interested me and my co-author, um, and we wanted to find an answer. So the first thing we did um, is we asked, well, you know, we studied the question of what is a complex system for a long time. And one thing that resulted from these conversations is what is uncontroversial about complex systems and complexity? And here I've listed a, a sequence of points, and I want to just look at one of them, which is point five, which is complex systems are often modeled as information processes. And why is that? So here's my attempt to an answer uh, to that question. And that, again, is based on, on work that I did with James Ladyman um, in many discussions we've had. This is one result. There's lots of other stuff in this book, which um, came out about a year ago. Uh, so if you're interested, you'll find more there. Here is the briefest summary I can possibly give you on what is a complex system or what is complexity. There are three types of properties that we have. This is, the, this is a list of properties that is always present in a complex system. They're always disordered in non-equilibrium. They consist of numerous elements. They're diverse and there's feedback in them. And then this is this list of features that makes them interesting, I would say, which is that they have nonlinear behavior, they are robust in, in more than one way. Of course, they're self-organized, which is maybe the feature, um, and I've shown you examples of that. There is occasionally a nested structure. And then there's a set of features which is reserved for functional systems and living systems. Okay, so we could talk about this list for a long time, but I'm just showing it to you here. And I want to link to the question of information processing. What does this list and our idea of complex system have to do with information processing, apart from the two examples that I've showed you? And that has to do with how do we measure complexity? So measuring complexity per se, in my view, is is not very sensical because there can't possibly be a single measure for systems that have all of these features. But we can measure individual aspects of these systems. And information theory is particularly good at this. It can measure disorder, diversity, self-organization, memory. Those are the most obvious ones. And then in an indirect way, it might measure some others as well. 
So this, in my view, is the reason why information theory is so prominent in the science of complexity. And taking that as a starting point could be good if we wanted to use them as actual information processes. <clears throat> And with that, I'm already coming to my conclusion. Information processing is distinct from self-organization. Self-organization is always present in complex systems. Information processing is present in some of them. And certainly information theory is a powerful data analytic tool set. Uh, also in, in my own research um, uh, in order to study complex systems. And with that, here are the you know, first reference is, is the paper in this particular focus issue, and then two others if you're interested in more of the background. Thank you. Thanks very much, Caroline, for being on time and also for your, in some sense, uh, provocative questions or, or remarks that I'm sure we will discuss later. Uh, we will postpone uh, questions for the audience to the uh, panel discussion at the end, and the audience can post questions in this uh, questions function which is in the uh, uh, go to webinar application and then uh, so we go to our uh, second uh, speaker today which is uh, Hiva Shehaiti if I pronounce it uh, uh, properly uh, which is a postdoc at the Institute of Systems Neuro Neuroscience in uh, Aix-Marseille in uh, France <coughs> and she's working on the uh, nonlinear dynamics of the uh, brain she is co author of the uh, paper in this focus issue with um, uh, Victor Girsa that could not join us uh, today at this time. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Eva, for being here today. The screen is yours. Thank you very much. I hope you can see uh, my slides in full screen. Yes, we do. Okay. So, uh, the paper that uh, was contributed to this focus issue is, is entitled Entropy, Free Energy, Symmetry and Dynamics in the Brain. And uh, the idea was to uh, unfold these concepts, which might uh, seem as disparate and from different fields of uh, uh, thought, but and then show how they can be linked and actually used in uh, context of modeling whole brain dynamics. So in these uh, few minutes, I'm just going to try to uh, go through them and highlight the main uh, conceptual links. And uh, please forgive me if I do not go into all the details. I hope we can uh, discuss more in the discussion if anyone uh, needs more clarification. So starting with the first um, concept of entropy. So if you go back to Prigogine's exposition on really what is the meaning of entropy, uh, he emphasized that really to understand entropy, we have to uh, look into the concept of time as going beyond just the notion of repetition and degradation as act and actually time as a constructive irreversibility. Uh, that can be seen to be embodied actually in living, living systems uh, perpetuating themselves through entropy exchanges with the environments. And in that sense, biology is seen to necessitate the inscription of time as irreversibility onto matter. And it mentions uh, Ingvar's postulate of the brain's ability to simulate memories of the future. What that means is that the brain, uh, through its entropic exchanges with the environment, developed, develops temporally polarized structures. Um, sorry, temporally polarized structures um, such that it can sustain and navigate experiences of the past, present, and future. And it's distributed across its, spatially across the different areas. And so this actually temporal polarization of the brain structures uh, gives rise to uh, behavior. So in behavioral studies, you could, uh, it's, it's really hard to define behavior. There's a lot of controversy, but I think one consensus would be 
as behavior constituting the set, set of internally coordinated actions of an, er, an uh, organism in presence of internal or external stimuli. And actually, the, in the field of ecological psychology, the interaction with the environment actually becomes central as the environment dictates or drives the various actions that the organism uh, can perform. And then comes coordination, the concept of coordination dynamics, where Scott Kelso formalized the idea of coordination as actually the functional ordering of interacting components in space and time. And here, uh, the loop of perception action that the living organism uh, sustains itself through is start, can you start to be seen as a dynamical system. And now we ask, how does the brain self-organize to actually sustain uh, such coordination or behavior? And for that, we resort to mathematical formalism that uh, underlying the emergence of dissipative structures in far from equilibrium systems. It's actually the field where Prigogine has won his Nobel Prize for and uh, basically the formalism relies on two main uh, elements. The first is entropy and fluctuations, which leads to irreversibility and hence also unpredictability of system dynamics. And the other arm is nonlinearity and instability, which gives rise to emergence and complexity. And hence with the presence of uh, fluctuations, the dynamics dictate us evoking probabilistic cons concepts to com compensate for our inability to actually precisely capture individual trajectories of the system. And then using Lagrange's theory of first kind, we could solve for probability distributions that actually maximize information entropy or equivalently minimize free energy in the presence of deterministic constraints that uh, could take the form of measurements of uh, physical observables. And so well, what is, well, how can we actually quantify or formulate entropy? So in classical thermodynamics, it's uh, the known relationship between uh, macroscopic quantities such as heat, temperature and exchange of energy. And then the statistical mechanics that followed formulated entropy as a function of logarithms of probabilities of the system to be in different possible microscopic states. And that functional form actually of entropy and statistical mechanics is identical to that of Shannon's information entropy, which goes beyond just uh, um, the physical variables in statistical mechanics to actually represent probabilities of variables uh, taking on different possible values. Now, in, um, in, in the 50s, Edwin James actually related these uh, two concepts that on a deeper level can actually be seen as uh, measures of uncertainty represented by a probability distribution. And so in both cases, uh, the problem is posed as one of prediction of probability distributions subject to constraints of physical observables. And uh, in which the and in that case, the probability distribution which has the maximum entropy is the only unbiased choice to actually uh, be made. Now, this uh, and actually in his maximum information principle uh, paper, the, he, uh, James defines, let's say, uh, the, his expression for information entropy by saying there's an unambiguous criterion for the amount of uncertainty represented by a probability distribution, which intuitively means that a broad distribution represents more uncertainty than a sharp one, like a delta function, for example. And this, this, and, uh, this probability distribution has to, this definition of entropy actually leads us to the functional form that is well known. Now, in uh, conjunction with that, 
comes the deterministic features in the uh, in the system that can be expressed as correlations on uh, the observables. And then with the normalization requirement that the sum of probabilities should be one, this can actually, uh, this actually provides us with a deterministic and stochastic influences within which the information entropy has to be a maximum. And doing the math, uh, we arrive at uh, an expression for the probability distribution of for maximum entropy as a uh, in terms of these actually deterministic correlations. Now, how, how does this uh, uh, enter in a study of brain dynamics? And actually, uh, this leads us to the free energy principle formulated by Carl Friston, Friston uh, to describe how adaptive self-organized systems resist the thermo natural thermodynamical tendency to disorder. And actually, the theory of predictive coding, one of the most influential uh, uh, contemporary theories of brain function postulates that the brain operates as a Bayesian inference system. So the brain is actually minimizing uh, 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 its free energy and it's, it's realizing an internal generative model that can perform predictions about the outside world that can be continuously compared against sensory input and the, the prediction errors allow the updating of the inter internal model. So, uh, in a way, the, the, the brain is trying to fit the parameters or, or uh, set its, the parameters of its own internal generative model uh, to sort of using this kind of maximum entropy uh, principle. And uh, yeah, so. But also, we have we want to match that. Uh, on the other hand, to uh, the view of so this is the sort of the information entropy view of how the brain operates. But on the other hand, we have the dynamical systems uh, 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 framework. Let's say. And this takes us to the synergetics uh, framework of Herman Hacken, which presents a theory for self-organized pattern formation in open systems, that is systems that are actually exchanging matter, energy, or information with the environment, and hence uh, entropic exchanges. And usually these systems are, are cons consist of a large number of weakly interacting microscopic elements far from thermodynamic uh, equilibrium, and they may self-organize into spatial temporally order, uh, ordered patterns. These patterns are microscopic in nature, but can be described by a small number of order parameters or collective variables. So effectively, this allows for a low dimensional description of the dynamical properties of the system. And then you could, uh, uh, the system can manifest spontaneous switching between such macroscopic patterns, which are known as non equilibrium phase trans transitions, where one macroscopic pattern would lose stability as another one uh, arises. And uh, to, uh, to, to see how this low dimensionality arises, uh, you would uh, uh, expand the dynamics around a working point where in state space you're around the uh, equilibrium equilibrium uh, solution that is losing stability and in parameter space you're you're close to the value of the parameter that leads to this phase transition and in these local conditions one of the eigenvalues of the jacobian of the linearized system will be zero and allows the application of the local center manifold theorem. So practically what this means that we will have a small subset of new variables, which we refer to as order parameters that arise and they dominate the system dynamics and enslaving the remaining variables by means of time scale separation. And um, so 
this is one way to see how you could uh, so synergetics or center uh, manifold theorem is one way to see how you can go from a high dimensional nonlinear system uh, made up of many microscopic elements to uh, uh, sort of a description of a lower dimensional uh, macroscopic uh, phenomenon. Mm -hmm. However, the um, that requires uh, sort of uh, confine, confining uh, the analysis to local regions in, in state space, which would be too restrictive when describing uh, something like brain dynamics, which is known to explore its full uh, uh, range of uh, state space. So we seek another uh, working point that could allow for a rising of uh, low dimensional dynamics on what we would refer to as these uh, uh, manifolds. So symmetry, and here we resort to symmetry as another guiding principle for their working point. So if we assume, so here in the uh, just a, a schematic cartoon of, we have a two dimensional system uh, described by uh, differential equations uh, for x dot and y dot. And then if we plot uh, the null lines of, uh, of the system, meaning the, the trajectories where uh, uh, the flow will be confined on, then uh, if a symmetry exists, then uh, for example, this is a simple case where the system has uh, the circle as the uh, invariant manifold, the system is symmetric, that meaning any perturbation along this manifold will, will, you will stay on it, but uh, uh, flow, if you're off the manifold, you will move towards it. And then if we break the symmetry, if we allow a small symmetry breaking, the null lines will separate, and now you could actually have flow, very slow flow along this invariant manifold. Excuse me, uh, Hiba, you should be uh, trying to finish so that we don't uh, go. Ah, oh, okay, <coughs> sorry, I was uh, thinking it's uh, 20 minutes. Okay, so let's let's skip over and see how is this related to uh, brain dynamics. In brain dynamics, usually we would use neural mass uh, models where uh, you'd use mean field uh, theory uh, to... I'm sorry, is it okay if I just take a few more minutes because... Uh, well, try, 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 to, try to summarize. Yeah, I'll try my best, yes, thank you. So, uh, basically neural mass models uh, have one uh, main characteristic that they actually have by stability that you have solutions that correspond to a down state and an up state. And uh, uh, this is a, a typical neural mass model where the mean firing rate and the membrane potential are described by a nonlinear ODE. And uh, if we linearize around the if we linearize around the solution, you will see that you going back to the probabilistic description, you could see that this the system will have a potential function that will be uh, minimized based on the correlation for the mean value. And if we couple two of these systems, again, the maximum entropy probability distribution is, uh, uh, is going to be restricted by the correlation of the mean variables and if the two nodes are not interacting, then you will see that this, uh, the probability distribution is uh, uniform in space. But now if we allow the two nodes to interact, and then we write down the expression for the probability distribution, of course here in the presence of some noise, this is the stationary solution to the Fokker-Planck equation, then we can re-express this as a actually two terms where you can see it taking the form of Bayes' theorem that takes us back to theory of free energy and predictive coding. And actually the term that arises here is the 
free energy that uh, captures uh, the interaction between the nodes as deformation of the stationary probability density. So with no coupling, you see it's just the two uh, Gaussians. And then in the presence of coupling, we see the probability distributions in state space deforming. So I will skip over here if we take more. Clear. Yeah, I will wrap up now. <clears throat> so the idea is that the organization of deterministic and stochastic influences can be captured as shape variations of probability distribution functions. The free energy appears naturally expressed by the flow on the manifold, which is generated by the coupling between network nodes. And during the process of active inference, the brain adjusts these, can adjust these coupling to change the corresponding flows as described by the probability distributions. So practically, the, what we're saying is that predictive coding explains how the brain and behavior are shaped through acting on the environment and observing one's uh, self. And the framework of uh, structured flows of manifold uh, offers a mechanistic picture of how the end result actually is embodied. And so basically it's the conceptualization of the spatial temporal infrastructure in space space of the constantly evolving generative model. And that's it. Sorry for going over time. Hope we can discuss more at the end. Thank you. Thank you very much, Eva. I think we can uh, move on to the uh, next presentation, which will be by uh, Mark Timmel. Uh, Mark is uh, professor of network dynamics at the uh, Technical University of uh, Dresden. He has worked on a variety of different topics towards the understanding of collective nonlinear dynamics of networks and complex systems, with applications in a broad range of topics that include mobility, energy system, network economy. And especially relevant uh, here are uh, by inspired thing. Please, Mark, go ahead. We don't hear you. Sorry. We don't hear you. Yes. Now? Okay, now. Yeah, okay, now. But, yeah, thanks, thanks to you, Marty, and also all the organizers of the focus session and in particular of this event. Welcome, everyone uh, who is listening. We are in our uh, contribution to the focus issue, we, we have been taking a step back to um, make a claim, actually in contrast to what Carolina Wiesner said, um, we, we claim that we can actually design complex systems dynamics to perform certain computations and you can hierarchize that in a certain um, dedicated way. This is work with Fabio schittler nevis who is co-author on the, on the um, paper, and also Jakob Lindemeyer, who is a student with us. So the main question is, how can we use and how can we design the collective nonlinear dynamics emerging in network systems in order to perform computations? So in this sense, we contradict Carolina Wiesner's claim, or we take the niche like those, we, we, we attempt to address those systems which actually can do computations in a complex self-organized way. And we take also the view of uh, bio-inspiration, um, which is um, helpful in many dimensions, in many directions. For example, in the dimension of energy efficiency, in terms of how the system computes, um, in terms of uh, resource efficiency, like how the system is built, for example, with few parts. Uh, robustness against noise and heterogeneity, and reconfigurability, for example, to, to adapt to the environment, to uh, be able to solve new tasks uh, if, for example, a part fails or if communication fails in some way partially. Um, so the reference here is to the, to the paper, and the paper is actually, a, it's called a brief introduction, and it actually is meant like that, and it's, it's taking a step back and then it's viewing in into a certain direction of nonlinear and network dynamics on bio-inspiration, and then it takes a particular way of focusing on spiking systems, which I'll come to in a second. So first of all, how can you, what is the design space? How can you design collective 
dynamics of networks. And I'm, I'm taking the perspective of dynamical systems theory. And the first thing I ask for a network is, can you design the topology? Like who is interacting with who? Generically, um, the, a, a network with processes information, for example, think of a neural network, um, is, consist, is receiving some inputs, which are the things to be processed. You can also have additional inputs, which are signals which control what kind of task that system here uh, performs. And then you have output signals, which are the results of the computation. And these output signals, in particular in autonomous systems, they control decision making, they control action and general behavior of the system. And there are obviously various design options of how you can structure this black box, this black box, gray box here. Um, you can uh, design it in several ways. For example, uh, a typical uh, 20th century neural network was consisting of layers, feedforward connections, and you can use these, for example, for image classification. There's more, uh, there are different kinds of networks which are recurrent, and these are known, for example, from, I'm losing my screen, I don't know whether you see me. Not, <clears throat> not now, I also lost your screen. Now, That's now strange. it comes again. Okay. Yeah, so it's very strange, I don't know what's happening. Um, recurrent networks, which, uh, for example, for the Hopfield model of associative memory, they represent recognized patterns um, as fixed points of the dynamics. And you can also think on a, on a more abstract level, higher level brain function um, is also somehow working like that, that on an abstract way. You, you, you get input and you recognize something, and this is represented in certain activities, which is distributed across the brain. There are more specific, specific um, uh, for example, pattern generator networks whose task is to generate, for example, periodic or close to periodic output patterns. And um, one um, new type of uh, network which has been suggested about 20 years ago is about uh, is reservoir computing or reservoir networks where um, the network itself here is static in the sense of there is not adaptive and the only thing which is changed during learning is the output links and this is particularly suited for example for time dependent uh, signal processing and now there's a second dimension in in design space which is about the unit like we didn't talk about the unit we only talked about the interactions and the unit you can design in very very broad uh, scope dynamical systems fashion. For example, um, obviously in a sta uh, with states which are continuous and vary continuously with time. And the opposite extreme, there are discrete states which iterate their, which update their, their, their value at discrete times. And then there's everything in between. In particular, there is the so-called hybrid systems, which are dynamical systems models for, for in particular for spiking neural networks, where continuous time evolution and continuous state evolution is interrupted by certain maps um, at given events. So you, if, you, if you reach a piece of your state space, something happens. For example, if a neuron reaches a certain threshold potential, it may reset and send a, a spike, a signal. So then there's a, something every one of you knows, uh, roughly, the, like you have a translation of the, what nature gives you, like the structure of a neural neuron cell. It's very bad that I lose the screen. Um, consisting of um, a cell body with dendrite where the signals go in. Um, depending on the internal state of the cell, signals are sent out and then they are distributed to other neurons or cells. And in modeling and in, in designing artificial systems, we take we try to capture the essential of those. So there are certain inputs. You have a neural node with certain nonlinearities, and there are outputs which are distributed. And one basic concept which we have been focusing on in the past years was uh, so-called K winners take all computations, which for spiking neurons or neural systems 
translate to the question of finding the largest k out of n inputs. And largest, you can interpret it. It's, it's up to you how you do that. But for, for simplicity, just think of constant inputs for now. Okay. So you have n different inputs. And the question is, can you find out which are the largest k ones? And here, uh, this is an example for, for, it looked like k equals 3 are those neurons which receive the largest signals. And the other n minus k neurons, they don't spike. So that's one way to, to, to conceptualize a computation. And that's called a k winner takes all computation because the k neurons spike and all the other neurons don't. So this is a boring computation because you never use it. But it has the potential of, by concatenating several of those, to actually be a, a universal problem solver, like in terms of, for example, binary, ternary, or any any digital inputs, you, you can show that uh, concatenating these k winner takes all the computations, um, you can compute everything you like, like all binary, all, all digital signals. Then, from a um, from a dynamics point of view, you can have very similarly looking. Um, spiking dynamics. So what you see is voltages which read thresholds and then there are spikes emitted. And in, a, in the simplest setting, they are periodic. And in both panels up in A and B, they are periodic initially, but then upon a perturbation, which you can think of a signal from the outside or a change of parameters, um, you have very different responses. One is resynchronized, so you are in a stable state, you go back to the same uh, periodic state, or you are unstable and you're on, at a saddle state where you desynchronize and go away to some other state. There's dynamical systems mechanisms. I don't go into detail, but there's the main difference between a super threshold input, like if you kick uh, neurons to fire upon the reception of spikes, or you uh, desynchronize them by only sub threshold inputs. Um, for like a decade now, we have uh, conceptualized the network of states um, concept, where here the states have been several periodic orbits. So each dot you see in the left hand side of uh, this plot, like each of these dots, is representing one periodic orbit of the entire the original system uh, of spiking neurons. So, and then if you add input signals, you select certain sequences of these. And they can be, in the simplest case, they are periodic. So the important thing is not that they are periodic, but that they are specific. They, they encode information about the signal. So um, information processing here is going on between the base state of our complex system, the input signals, and the, the type of encoding. There's another. Um, there's, there's one example what you can actually do with it, like, for example, um, a simple spiking network with 20 neurons and nine winners under certain conditions. And what you see here is just that the nine neurons actually fire and the other ones, they fire only sparsely and this is due to noise. So there's some noise uh, on top in the, in the input signal. And what you see is that these are the dominant ones. So it's actually a, a nine of the, out of 20. Well, there's one missing. There's a nine out of 20 uh, winner takes all. There's one reference. Now. There's a second type of dynamics, which I mentioned is stable dynamics. And for that, we invented recently the notion of proportional inhibition. Uh, inhibitory coupling is known from neuroscience modeling and also from bio-inspired neural networks. Uh, what is new here is that proportional inhibition is, uh, is keeping a type of memory from the past, although there's an instantaneous reset. So there's a dissipation built in, but it's not complete dissipation. And you can control the degree. So that's a, a fraction of the of the um, of the information is is uh, still there after the spike. That's the only thing you have to remember. And what it can result in is reconfigurable computations, which means that here I talked about k winner takes all and for one fixed parameter setting like all the coupling strengths and all the whatever delays and, and rise functions of the units 
if you have specified everything, you'll get one typical K, which computes your K winner takes all. So this is one point in this parameter space. And uh, what you see here is that with proportional inhibition, you get a large banded structure in parameter space, which is here the input spacing and the connection strength, meaning that independent of whether you're here or there, you compute exactly the same thing on the one hand. On the other hand, if you just change one parameter, the coupling strength, you can switch between different operations. You can reconfigure your system by changing one single parameter. Um, and the number of uh, the number k computed, um, well, sensitively depends on this connection strength. The strength of this, or the, the coolness of this uh, paradigm is that with relatively few neurons, you can, in a resource efficient way, build networks or systems which have which can solve many different tasks. So they can have 10 to the 16 like outputs because it's a combinatorial code, similar to perhaps the brain. With that, I, I like to um, come to an end and just give a small overview. So coupled K winner takes all subsystems um, can be used very efficiently and they can solve, can be solve, can be used to solve behavioral tasks autonomously. We have, um, we have, for example, run that on an obstacle mapping, mapping by an autonomously navigating drone. So the drone is flying here, a certain uh, trajectory in two-dimensional space. And while it does it with the three sensors, it maps out the world. And it's completely autonomous and it's run essentially on, on like a, a less than a dozen of neurons. There's, there's this flight controller which just keeps the thing in the air, but all the steering is done by a few neurons with, with simple K winner takes all uh, coupling. Um, if I have time, I would show a video, but I, I first finish my slide. So then next steps are healing dynamical systems. Can you self-correct if there's something wrong, if there was a, like an impact from outside or there's some parameter mismatch and you somehow did a wrong turn in your state space? Can you repair that? Can you deal with outliers or what does happen if you have large noise strengths? And the second line of research um, many people, including us, are, are going to now is self-repairing structures in the sense of what happens if you kill, for example, a cell? What happens if, if one of the, if you want to build it in hardware and you want to operate it, whatever, in outer space and, and, and a piece fails, what do you do? And the current state of the art is basically you make the system entirely redundant, just have two systems which are identical and if one fails you take the other but there are much more clever uh, approaches to that based on the self-organization of complex systems and on design options these deliver and with that i'd, I'd like to thank you but before you leave uh, if i have time i would show you a video about this drone which is you see here in the picture it's just a corner of an office with a with a shelf here and some different dimensions and some different obstacles which are very basic. And you, here is plotted the trajectory of the guy. Um, it's flying this direction and it's completely behaving in terms of its sensory inputs. It's reacting on, on the base of a five neuron computation, which are um, taking uh, three winner takes all out of five. So what you see here, oh, so doesn't really work. What you see here is, um, Response uh, sensor signs of of the different um, operations, and at which position um, you would the, the the autonomous drone would map the, the the wall or the boundary of its of its operation. You see, it's obviously not exact, but it gives a nice qualitative feature, and I find it very impressive. So, given that you have like five neurons, like which insect with five neurons can do that. Um, uh, you see that it qualitatively reproduces the form and shape of the of the environment. It finds these corners, and it it also navigates autonomously without crashing. Well, it actually sometimes crashes at the current state, but it's a matter of of uh, fine tuning parameters. So thank you for your attention, and um, I'm I'm happy to discuss. Thanks very later. much, Mark. Uh, very impressive. Uh, we move to the uh, next presentation by <coughs> Dan Gauthier, which is Professor of Physics and uh, 
Electrical and Computer Engineering at the Ohio State University. Uh, Dan is an experimentalist who studies the physics of information. He has worked on uh, quantum aspects of computation, communication and machine learning, and, uh, and also classical aspects of information processing, neural networks and artificial intelligence. Dan, the screen is yours. I don't see the... Um, we, see the, we see the screen, but we don't see it in a full screen mode. Ah, thank you. Now it's okay. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I'd like to um, just do a brief overview of our uh, contribution to, to the special issue. We're going to talk about model free control of dynamical systems using deep reservoir computing. Uh, I'm Dan Gothier. I'm with uh, Ohio State University and also ResCon Technologies. It's commercializing some of what I'll be telling you about today. Uh, the work was led by Daniel Kande, who was a graduate student with, with me at Ohio State University. And a collaborator, Andrew Pomerantz, is with Potomac Research. And Daniel now has also joined Potomac Research. So just as a quick overview we're thinking of some kind of dynamical system here i'm just showing the strange a, a, attractor for a chaotic system and the idea is that we're going to perform observations on this dynamical system feed it into an artificial neural network and then do feedback closed loop feedback that will attempt to control the dynamical system actually quite similar to the video we just saw of a drone in the previous uh, presentation. I'll illustrate this uh, using a fairly well-known dynamical system from people that have been studying chaos over the years. This is a, uh, a very simple uh, system that was the first one known to show chaos. I refer to this as the Lorentz 63. Uh, Edward Lorentz was one that developed this model, and the work was published in 1963, hence the, the name. And this is uh, trying to take a very challenging problem of turbulent flow uh, between two plates. So the idea is I have a fluid uh, between two infinitely large plates. There's a temp temperature difference between these plates, and as you increase the temperature difference, you start to see uh, convective rolls that form and then for even strong forcing, uh, you start to see chaotic behavior. So these uh, roles uh, go, go unstable. And uh, Lorentz postulated the, this mo model that contains three scalar variables that represent uh, temperature differences within the fluid or mass flow. And these are nonlinear dynamical systems. You can see there's a term here like XY or XZ. And for thinking about control, uh, what I'm assuming is that there's some way that I can perturb or affect this uh, system. And these are what are usually called control perturbations. And the way that we consider them here are just additive terms that show up uh, in these differential equations that describe the Lorentz 63 system. So these are some kind of knobs or signals that I can adjust to try to control uh, the behavior of the system. And just to try to put this uh, in a little bit more of a, a firmer foundation, I'm going to take the set of three differential equations and put them into a, a vector X. It has just components X, Y, and Z. And the set of differential equations together with the control perturbations uh, can be described by some kind of nonlinear functional F that is a function of the state vector X and the control perturbations V that I apply to the system. Now, formally, I can integrate uh, th this uh, set of differential equations to find what's called the flow. And the idea is that I'd like to be able to make a prediction of the state of the system at one step into the future, where, where delta is, is the step size. And I'm thinking that delta is not large, uh, but it's not infinitesimal. So I'm making some finite step into the future. And the flow, uh, using a script F here to differentiate it from the vector field, is also going to be a functional 
um, of the state and the control perturbations. So what I'd like to do for control is to be able to force the system to have some desired state one step into the future. So remember, I'm doing observations of the system, so I know what the current state is, and I would like to design perturbations that I apply to the system that will force the system to go to a desired behavior one step in the future. And in general, a reservoir computer is a type of recurrent artificial neural network that's ideally suited for learning dynamical systems and especially for learning the flow. So this at least gives a hint that a reservoir computer might be a good approach for trying to do control. And so what I'd like to do though is to turn this around. This is something that I specify. I know the current state, but I, I don't know the perturbations that I need to apply to the system to force it to go to this state. So in a very loose, crude mathematical sense, I need to invert the system so I can find the control perturbation. So I have the current state of the system, which I observe or measure. I have the desired state, which is what I'm going to specify. And I'd like to know, how do I perturb this? So I wanna use a reservoir computer to see, can it learn this inverse so that I can affect control? So we give one example of the paper uh, using this Lorentz uh, system. This is the strange uh, attractor related to that Lorentz system. So this is a set of trajectories in phase space, which I've just compressed down onto the X, Z plane. So a point in phase space is, uh, tells you the unique state of the system. And as a function of time, that point traces out a trajectory. And since it's chaotic, this is on a strange attractor. So the idea is that I want to be able to perform observations mm -hmm. of the system, use a reservoir computer that can learn the inverse, and then apply those control perturbations back to the Lorentz system. And for this particular example I'm showing here, we're trying to stabilize what's known as an unstable steady state. So it's a point that's right in the middle of this wing of, of the butterfly uh, of the strange attractor, where uh, if you were to place it there, it would stay there forever, except if there's a little bit of noise that kicks the system, then it will eventually go away. That's why we say it's an unstable steady state. So uh, I'm not gonna go into the details, but we have two phases for controlling. So we have to learn how do the perturbations affect the system so that we can learn that inverse map. And then we use that trained model, that trained reservoir computer to then do closed loop feedback. So this is uh, uh, the phase where we're learning that, that inverse. And so we're giving tiny perturbations to uh, the system that are just random in an open loop fashion and see how it responds. And then we go and close the loop. We go into the second phase where we try to control it. And, and what we see is that the control perturbations do a great job of getting rid of the chaotic dynamics and puts the system in some steady behavior. Uh, unfortunately, though, the steady behavior is not exactly at the unstable steady state. And we can tell that by looking at the size of the control perturbation. So that's what's shown in this lower plot. The control perturbation doesn't go all the way to zero. And since this is an unstable set of the system, the control perturbation should go to zero if we really truly control the proper um, unstable steady state. So um, what uh, Daniel came up with is the idea that if I have a reservoir computer that's controlling the Lorentz system, I can think of this now as a new effective dynamical system. So now I can take a second reservoir computer that's reading in the same information, adding control perturbations to the first one, and it's now the second reservoir is controlling the Lorentz plus the first reservoir. So I can just think of this as a layered or deep uh, type of structure for control. And, and what we find is that, sure enough, the control perturbations get smaller and smaller the more layers we add. And what's shown in here in this kind of middle noisy type plot, that's where we're perturbing the first reservoir to get that's coupled to the Lorentz system. We're giving it tiny perturbations to try to learn the inverse of this first system. And then we close the loop and see how well it performs. And we kick it around a little bit, try to learn a better approximation for that inverse, so on and so, so forth. So the layered approach or this deep approach uh, drives the control error to zero. So in, in summary, 
Uh, I've mentioned that reservoir computers are a universal approximator for dynamical systems. They can be used for prediction, system identification, and what I've shown today is on control. Um, it can learn these dynamics very quickly uh, in, in that the training procedure for controlling this dynamical system essentially can be done in, in, in real time. And in our paper, we talk about controlling a chaotic electronic circuit that kind of has millisecond type dynamics. And we find that we can learn and, and then uh, control it on these uh, very fast timescales. And that um, kind of using this uh, approach of a layered system or a deep system improves the uh, control accuracy. And one important application uh, uh, for this type of approach is that if something changes to the system, uh, I need to be able to adjust this control law. Let's say it might be due to a damage event uh, on a drone. Let's say I lose a propeller. And this control law can be learned so quickly that I can learn uh, a new control law and then apply it before the, the drone crashes. So, thank you very much for your attention. Thanks very much, uh, Dan, for your presentation. And uh, we move to the uh, last presentation by Roberta Zambrini, which is a tenure scientist at the uh, Institute for Cross Disciplinary Physics and Complex Systems in Mallorca, in Spain. Uh, she has been working in different aspects of uh, complex systems from a quantum perspective. And uh, especially relevant for this focus issue is uh, her work on new aspects of quantum reservoir computing and quantum machine learning. Uh, Roberta, uh, go ahead, please. Okay. Just a second, I lost my same screen. Can you see my screen? No. No. Now, now, perfect. Go ahead. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so uh, today's talk is about this uh, contribution to JFIS complexity, a work realized uh, in collaboration uh, with all the team here. I'm not mentioning, we have not so much time. And uh, in particular, this work is in the context of reservoir computing that has been mentioned also in the two previous talks. And uh, this is a machine learning method, a supervised machine learning method in which actually a complex system is used as a reservoir to process information. And typically the input information is a temporal signal um, and the reservoir computing is processing this information that is sent to the output layer. And it is only in the output layer that the training takes place. So this method has been introduced two decades ago, has been shown to be successful in several applications going from speech uh, recognition to complex time series prediction and we have seen an example in the previous talk of an application uh, in control uh, theory and um, typically the good performance of the system exploits the high dimensionality of a complex system its internal memory and non-linearity and uh, the advantages of this approach are that actually this can be used in a different physical platform it's uh, uh, easily trainable and uh, it can be multitasking. So, in uh, 2017, there was a proposal to extend this classical reservoir computing into the quantum regime. The proposal by Fuji Nakajima was actually uh, considering a disorder transverse easing model. And then, the information could actually be uh, classical information could be encoded in this quantum system, and uh, a good performance of the system was actually reported. Actually, between the reason to move into the quantum regime with this kind of uh, machine learning approach is the possibility to exploit a larger Hilbert space, uh, the possibility to implement this kind of uh, uh, machine learning protocols in uh, noisy intermediate scale quantum devices that at present are already available. And uh, there are also, um, it is also promising the possibility to exploit quantum effect and quantum correlation to. Uh, see if any advantage can actually arise in this system. So in analogy with uh, uh, machine learning, in, in which we, uh, where we speak about quantum machine learning, when we have input that are quantum or an algorithm that is quantum, also in quantum reservoir computing, we can take a similar uh, approach also to see which is the kind of different contribution that we have in the literature. And we can consider quantumness in the input data in the reservoir substrate or in the task. 
And in particular, in this talk, I will consider the case in which it is the substrate that is quantum. And it is actually something that has been explored in different platforms that range from nuclear magnetic resonance to trap tri uh, trapped ions, superconducting circuits on photonics implementation, uh, or atomic lattices. Uh, I will focus here uh, uh, in two uh, kind of complex networks used as reservoirs. Uh, one is the case that we mentioned before, the case of disorder transverse easing model, in which we have disorder here in the magnetic fields and in the coupling. So we have actually a network of qubits. And in the other case, we will consider a network of harmonic oscillators. So in this case, we have disorder in the coupling, eventually also in the frequencies, and we have um, position coupling. So we have just a linear network. And we will consider continuous variable. Of course, these are two models that can be realized in a plethora of uh, realization and I mentioned here two that are particularly promising. One is the possibility to realize them in ion, uh, net, um, ion net or trapped ion experiments, like in this uh, um, lab of Chris Moore and the, uh, Monroe, sorry, Christopher Monroe. And uh, here we have the other possible implementation that is in uh, photonic for the quantum harmonic oscillator, considering frequency combs interacting with the linear media. The use of both platforms has been shown to be successful for quantum reservoir computing. And in particular, in the case of qubits, we have recently shown how it is important also to understand which is the phase in which the system are operating. So um, the complex system can uh, be, for instance, in the case of this transverse in model in phase that are known to exhibit a thermalization or localization. And the, some of these phases are more uh, useful uh, because they allow like the thermalization because they allow the spread of information than other like the localization phase in which actually reservoir computing is not performing well. On the other side in this other work we have shown that even linear systems like quantum harmonic oscillator in a network uh, can be used for versatile uh, reservoir computing tuning the input uh, state. So for instance even using the phase of squeeze vacuum it is possible to have uh, um, a, a very um, powerful uh, performance in reservoir computing and to prove universal. So this is the scope of the uh, paper in uh, this special issue. The scope here was very pedag pedagogical and it was the attempt to get some analytical results because there were many numerical results and we wanted to see if it was possible to show the origin of nonlinearity and memory in, uh, in an analytical way. So what we did was just to follow the dynamics of one of these quantum systems, and of course one could immediately object to okay, but the dynamic of quantum systems is linear, but of course the linear dynamics is linear in the state, while here we are interested in the nonlinearity emerging in the processing of the input information that can be encoded in different way into the system. So the nonlinearity can actually arise in different parts of the system and it is deeply related in our case we are exploring the input effect and then it is important also to consider how the output layer is built. So we start to consider how is the case of the qubit network and uh, both in the case of qubits and harmonic oscillators we will consider uh, this kind of uh, evolution in which we write the state of the system in one of the components of the network and then we have the elements coupled to all the other together unitarily and then we start the information and we inject the following input again. So the first attempt of course is uh, to just uh, inject in one of the nodes of the easing network a pure state in which the classical temporal series is injected as the, pay, as the weight um, entering into the superposition state and what we get in this case if we actually consider just one step of the evolution we can actually monitor how the nonlinearity evolves into the system, you will have a linear contribution and a nonlinear term of this form. Considering different observables in the output layer, we will have then different linear and nonlinear behavior. Here, for instance, we show uh, the local value of the Pauli matrix and observe the different linear and nonlinear behavior we can actually get. But the form of the weights depends also on the choice of the observables and on the dynamical phase in which we are. And what we see is actually that if we are uh, in a phase that uh, prevents 
uh, information spreading into the system when we have localization, and we consider, for instance, in this case, another observable, that is a correlation between a pair of spins, what we actually have is that the qubit correlation is a completely uh, unresponsive with respect to the input injection that is in the x-axis, and we have only in the ergodic or thermal phase a real reaction of the system up to input injections. If we change this input encoding, we will get different uh, uh, performance of the systems, and in particular, we will observe here different nonlinear behaviors, encoding in the phase, if we allow for complex weights here, or encoding in just mixed state, we will have a linear answer and a nonlinear response if we inject instead with mixed state, but in different nodes. So you can find more results in the, in the paper, but the point is the possibility to actually monitor how this input is actually moving into the system and providing different linear and non-linear contribution also at different time. And if we go to the case of harmonic oscillator, we have again the possibility to monitor, at least in the case of continuous variable Gaussian states, the dynamic of this uh, input uh, uh, encoded into the system. And we find that uh, depending on the encoding that can be in coherent states, in vacuum, squeeze states or in thermal states, we actually can get different responses of the system again. We will consider uh, covariance matrix for certain moments and here just a picture to show the kind of results that we get in this case with both linear and non-linear responses emerging into the system. And as a curiosity, the fact that we need to go actually to different observables in order to get cross terms that can be necessary for some tasks. So we need to consider cross-correlation in instead of covariance matrices to get this kind of thing. In conclusion, quantum necessary computing can provide a new avenue for machine learning in which we move from circuits to complex physical reservoirs. The advantages, uh, some advantages have been already recognized and uh, some need to be further explored, as I mentioned at the beginning. In this paper, you will find some uh, analytical evidence of the nonlinear memory emerging in this uh, in a couple of very representative systems, and we are now moving on uh, considering possible implementation and the problem of quantum measurement in this lab. I thank you for your attention. I don't know if I was late, and uh, I announced just a two year opening uh, in quantum response computing. Thank you very much, Roberta, for your presentation. I will ask now all the um, the speakers to join with their webcam um, so that we can have a roundtable discussion here and also the other guest editors. Now we've seen a, a number of uh, different approaches and points of view, uh, ranging from uh, uh, fundamental concepts to, to what do we mean by information processing in a complex systems, uh, all the way down to quantum aspects of uh, reservoir computing. And uh, perhaps uh, you know, we have uh, uh, some time to discuss uh, uh, these ideas. We might we might have some questions from the uh, from the audience, but I would uh, like to invite uh, you, the, the speakers, uh, to questions, uh, uh, comments, and, uh, and to challenge among uh, among yourselves on what you have just uh, uh, said. So feel free to go ahead and question and interrupt. Um, Perhaps uh, to set a little bit of context, I, I, I can start. I mean, my, my impression is that the general question we are addressing from many different uh, points of view is uh, what do complex systems uh, uh, have to contribute uh, to advance the, the new information processing that we have, including machine learning and artificial intelligence and neuromorphing, uh, brain science computing. So, this is the general question of what we can uh, contribute, but, but perhaps to be more specific uh, or a little bit more specific, what I would like to, to ask all of you, the speakers, is how are you thinking, how do we go from analyzing different complex systems uh, to extract general concepts and to use these concepts to define uh, a task? So the question is, is there a future or what is the future for something that we might call uh, engineering complex systems? And by that, I mean 
the designing and constructing a complex system for a specific task of uh, information processing. And of course, this question is also related to what we mean by this information processing that was uh, well discussed at the very beginning by uh, by Caroline. So please uh, go ahead if you want to say something uh, along these ideas. Any of you? Hello, Caroline. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> I just jump in there. Thank you, Maxi, <laughs> for kicking us off. Um, the reason I jumped in here was because um, Mark said in his presentation he was contradicting my point of view and. I think I think he actually isn't. I think we're perfectly in line. And let me let me just briefly say why I think that. Because um, in in most, if not all, of the examples, really impressive, uh, both theoretical and experimental examples that we've seen, the a complex system is taken, and the you know what I call um, the symbolic encoding is being put on top, right? The the neuron you know, might not know what you're trying to achieve, that you're trying to actually steer a, a drone, for example. And it also doesn't care, but you care. And you're taking, you're using the computation in that system to, in order to achieve a particular task, um, which I think is what Maxi has in mind when, you know, one of the things when he says we should harness that computation. So that's my brief response to, to Mark. Go ahead, Mark. Yes. Speak up, speak up uh, at any time. Yeah, thanks. Um, thanks. I, I, I completely agree, Colleen, with, with you. Colleen. Um, the, the, I think the real task is first, and maybe it's a question also to you, like, isn't it true that, that it's always the humans, the experimenters, the analysts, the researchers, the users, who define the symbols, like who, who do the assignment of meaning to the, for example, to the dynamics of a complex system. And well, this part is a question. And the second is maybe a comment. As we've seen in in several contributions, um, I remember in particular Daniel Gutierrez that um, I think the future of designing computational systems is if you consider them in terms of a general uh, inverse problems of dynamical. So you have a dynamical system which is somewhat complex, and and you want to you want this system to do a, to solve a particular task or range of tasks or to process certain types of information. Um, and for that, it's a it's a design problem. So, so we really have to understand high dimensional or multi dimensional, say, um, inverse problems of dynamical systems. I think that's a big big chunk for the next decade or two or longer, I don't know. Um, we are creeping in from one side and other people are creeping in from other sides, but it's, it's really a theoretical challenge. And then you have to translate that to technology, right? You can always build, not always, I mean, it's hard to build, but you can, if you build something and it does a computation in hardware, then you have solved a particular problem, but it's unclear how you can generalize, right? And this is only a, possible in a in a co-research framework between experimentalists who actually build stuff with with theoreticians who think on the more abstract level. Hi Dan, go ahead. Yes. If I could go. The, the, one of the real challenges for I think the entire field is really figuring out how this is going to integrate with existing information processing systems. Right now, there's just such a, an enormous infrastructure and in industry built up around standard computation that it's very hard to break in with a new technology and really have it make an impact. And give examples of uh, there, there are companies that have designed neural processor chips like uh, IBM and they've been available within IBM uh, for, for now many years, and they haven't sold any. And I haven't seen any products or any problem that those chips have solved, even though they invested certainly millions of dollars in making a custom chip. And so um, I, I think looking at 
kind of the edges of standard processing. So looking at quantum computing, where it's still quite young and there isn't as many uh, things that are set in stone, we might have an impact. And, and then on the true biology side of being able to um, process biological signals, there's still a chance that a sensor uh, that is using these ideas that might be the front end uh, of a processor uh, is likely to succeed. But in the end, we have to figure out most of the data we process is usually already in a standard computational format. It's going to be hard to re-encode it in a different way. So really to have an impact on the field, we've got to really be thinking carefully about how do we integrate with the existing infrastructure. Thanks. May I chip in here? Go ahead, Ingo, please. Uh, first of all, thanks all speakers for their inspiring contributions. I think it was also a good sign that today we had uh, more female than male speakers uh, in, in the seminar or the webinar. Um, what you just mentioned for the for bridging um, or connecting to the state of the art technology uh, in computing, certainly the, the, then we're talking about the next five years. But if you're talking about, let's say, more about next 10, 20 years, uh, we certainly have the gap between the existing biological systems like the brain, um, as Hiva was presenting, and certainly the engineering side. And uh, isn't complex system science actually ideal, actually, for bridging uh, these two uh, parts and bringing in new innovations for novel technologies? Because who else? could do that if not complex system science were able to, as uh, Mark called in his paper, conceptualize or um, choose the, the, the proper level of abstra abstraction. Any comment on that remark? Well, along what, what Dan was saying the other day, I was talking with Ingo. And we were wondering, I mean, now there are computers that have a quantum level. Uh, now, should we aim for computers with the level complexity or even with the level of complex quantum computers? I mean, this is, I think, what Dan was, uh, what Dan was saying. I mean, uh, mm -hmm. how, how do we handle the actual infrastructure with these new ideas or these new technology? Right. So if I may even emphasize that a bit more. So the question is, do we, do we underestimate the power of complexity and collective dynamics for information processing? So when we talk about at the moment a lot about um, quantum supremacy, could that be something also that would be, could be named as complexity supremacy in computing? Smile from Caroline, go ahead. <laughs> Well, I, I strongly object to the use of supremacy, but that's a different subject. Um, <laughs> I, I'm, a question to probably all of you is the the strength of complex systems is, um, you know, if we look at them through the glasses of, of a computation, what they do is they get it right most of the time. Um, but not always because there are stochastic systems and they are because they're robust to noise that also means they will never give you a perfect output whereas a computation and a computer scientist you want the answer to be um you know precise so how how to bridge that gap and my my guess is daniel has well he's doing something he's commercializing something so he must have bridged that gap um is that is that is the question even a relevant one maybe if i could just uh, uh one thing that comes to mind is i think uh, it's a trade-off because uh if you want something that's perfect that will always perform uh in, a, in a, an expected way and uh, repeatedly then this is going to come at the price of uh, flexibility and adaptation so the idea is that uh, uh so the way, for example, that the brain learns is that you it's you act on the world in a kind of a undirected way in order to sample as uh, and as efficiently as possibly 
in a way. And then this, this stochasticity allows you to go off target in order to sort of learn new ways of doing what you might have done. So I think this is actually an added value in complex system that you, this stochasticity, explore, para, you explore the possibility of trajectories in order to learn to optimize certain objectives. Now, also from another perspective, maybe we can add, uh, if it is really a matter of uh, perfect predictability, as Caroline, are you uh, indicating also the quantumness? <laughs> The quantum origin is not really getting to the best in this moment about that. So the coherence is also forbidding in this moment. In this, uh, you you play with the IBM uh, quantum experience and you will read immediately a notice which are the limitations. So at least uh, we can say in answer to Ingo, this is a common challenge for both quantum inside and complex inside. And uh, in uh, in terms of uh, having um, which is the the most promising uh, way um, to pursue uh, powerful computation. I, I don't have an answer, of course, <laughs> but uh, still I think that it is very important to learn during the way. So in the process of uh, uh, trying to put together these concepts of complex system, quantum system, different per perspective, we learn a lot about all this complementary framework. And I think this is a uh, this is also an important point, independently on the final technological application and target. Along these lines, and I mean in the talk and the uh, paper by, by Eva and also by Mark, there is an emphasis on, on, on conceptual integration um, from different areas. Now, could we make a list of what are these general concepts that we can extract by looking at different complex systems that uh, we think might be important or what is their importance of these uh, concepts coming from complex systems analysis to this, uh, the, what I call the uh, complexity engineering. Is, is any of you uh, willing to start uh, a list of possible concepts that are relevant to that? Well, the first thing that comes to mind when I when you say complex systems is emergence. The idea that there's uh, that the, the sum is the the whole is more than the sum of the parts. That the nonlinearity, the complexity allows for uh, an emergence that is uh, more than just the li linear superposition of what the individual elements uh, can do. And this comes through self-organization in a way. So. I'll be my list. I'll leave others to continue the list. Yeah, I, just to add to that, the the aspect of self organization is which which is really the contrary to standard computation, where you have you know have you, you have a central computing element which is directing the the algorithm through, um, which is very different in a complex system. Yeah, if I could add to that the but actually going back further of there are some problems that probably can't be solved in this approach where you do need an exact answer. Let's say I'm doing cryptography. I really want to make sure that I properly encrypt or decrypt the message and I can't live with any errors in, in, in doing that. But there are many optimization problems where maybe I don't care if I get the absolute global minima, but if I get something that's very close to it, I'm probably happy. So that's where self-organizing dynamical systems have already shown great, great promise in being able to solve optimization problems. And I would say that some class of the quantum computers are doing exactly that, like like the D-Wave machine that, that's working on that, that type of, trying to find a ground state. So trying to find a, a global, or as close to a global min, minima as you could find. So that's probably where some low-hanging fruit is sitting, is waiting to really identify optimization problems that people really, really care about and that standard computational techniques don't do a good job. Yes, I just want to, to emphasize that uh, so I'm I'm at the cent I'm not only in the theoretical physics, but also in the Center for Advancing Electronics Dresden. And some of my engineering colleagues, they're actually working on the like in terms of integrating, they're working from the other end. Like one uh, one 
person is or two people are working two groups are working on approximate computing with standard digital um, uh, computers uh, but it's a bit, they are somehow working the other way towards us like they want to get in for applications which do not need the complete exactness can you be more energy efficient faster and so on with for example with an adaptive number of bits you want to you want to take into account another um, engineer uh, from the electrical engineering department he is working on um, integrating spiking parts with standard digital parts like things which, which i presented with with standard um, um, pieces of current digital technology so it's not it's not either or and it's also not our only us going towards them but it's also the the the, the world which wants to be integrated coming towards us because um, they, they notice that they have they have limitations in size they have limitations in energy consumption in resources and so on so they actually i think it's converging it's not it's not within the next few years but it is i think it's converging i think it's very promising to do it it's not an integration one-sided would any of you buy the the idea of what i would call um, i mean uh, probabilistic uh, uh, probabilistic uh, forecast or, or something like that which i think is related to the uh, Nobel prize of physics uh, this year in the sense that uh, well we have different scenarios we may have different replicas of the system and there is a stochasticity and therefore what we might aim to compute is uh, uh, some a probabilistic outcome of different scenarios as a general concept that comes out from complex systems. Do you think this is a message that one could send? Yes, no? Okay. Yeah, th there are many papers already published on uh, stochastic or probabilistic computing. And so, so that's, that is a growing field. But again, it's what, what problems are you willing to live with a probabilistic outcome? There's a certain class, but I think there's probably a set of important problems there. And maybe what, what the field might do is try to identify what, what's the uh, one problem that we might be able to solve that will really get many other fields paying attention. So what, what, what's the, the biggest application we could go after and then maybe if some of the community comes together and tries to tackle these couple problems, that that might be a good way for the field to to move forward. We also have here a question for Dan from the audience. It says, "How the size? Uh, let me see if I can read that. How the how the size of the control perturbation once you learn uh, the dynamics depends on the artificial net, neural network parameters." Does increasing the size of the network uh, reduce um, the size of the control perturbation? Or is there some other parameter more critical for improving this issue? Right, so in, in trying to find the in inverse control, there's something that's quite surprising that as you increase the size uh, of a single reservoir, um, you more accurately learn the inverse, but then it doesn't generalize very well. The control perturbations actually get bigger. So there is an optimum reservoir size, and it's actually quite small. And so it was much better to use a layered approach with many smaller reservoirs rather than one lar large uh, reservoir. And, and that it really isn't learning the inverse all that well. It gets it sort of close, and so just throwing more resources at, at it seems to, to not help. Uh, there's some interesting bifurcation structure there that we haven't fully explored. Uh, so you need a minimum size reservoir, and then suddenly it starts to work pretty well. Uh, but then if you increase the size, it starts to degrade. To, uh, degrade. Uh, that's something still to be explored. Okay. More comments from any of you? That, Maybe uh, from, from my side, regarding the notion you. that, that Carolina uh, brought up, uh, that uh, the precision of the computation might be certainly difficult with complex systems. But uh, it's, isn't it also such that even if you use a Neumann computer, 
like people do for neural networks. Um, but that doesn't guarantee you that you get a, a precise result because you have the adversarial examples as one issue, for example, for autonomous driving or image recognition, so that it's rather in the concept of the task um, rather than the machine that you're using or whether you're using uh, analog complex system or a digital computer, uh, whether you get imprecisions or wrong results or not. And I think that their complex system science could play a helpful role. But uh, I would be very happy to hear certainly controversial uh, points to that. No, I, I think you're right. It's just, um, which I think Hiba also said, it's, it's more regarding it as a feature rather than a bug and then using it to, um, you know, using the strength that it clearly has um, and the comparisons. I'm, I'm very intrigued by these comparisons because actually the, the longer I think about it, the more computational tasks are really being performed in a, you know, an approximate way. Um, so it, it's, I, I think it's a very, very intriguing a line of thought to to bring in the strength of complex systems, which include the resistance to noise, and also they they re, they do require noise to really work, um, which is considered by many a bug, but it's really a feature in some sense. Coming back to my having an impact, though, the, all, almost all of our governments that um, are I think are part of uh, the panel are very resistant to approving or certifying new techniques for, let's say, control or for, for, for learning. Um, they're seen too much as a black box. And so that's really a challenge to the community is coming up with explainability. Because right now, at least here in the United States, the Federal um, Aviation Administration won't um, approve um, neural network type controllers for for anything that has human human passengers on flight, and um, the the uh, community for autonomous cars seems to be a little bit more accepting, but but barely, because uh, it can be really disastrous if um, your error is saying telling the car to go off a cliff instead of taking the exit, and um, so who's going to be um, liable for for that death? And here in the U.S., where legal everyone sues everyone uh, that, that's a bit of a concern here uh, of who's ultimately responsible for causing that death it, is it the designer of the algorithm so it's just practical things that we have to think about and, and, but it's the provability to the extent that we can explain how these things work in a very clear and, and precise way but will increase the probability of having an impact Hey, one, one thing we, we did not touch upon is uh, swarms. I mean, <clears throat> Caroline would say that those are not information processing. There is no input and output. But uh, can we use what we know about swarms in any way uh, for designing information processing uh, uh, systems? Or any idea on that? No. Just to just to mention another colleague of mine, not in Dresden, uh, Langford, <laughs> they're actually using swarms of drones to individually collect images in a way so they 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 in online, like in real time, they coordinate their flight motion to optimize um the information they get out from their cameras, the collective information, like not the individual one. Because individually you want to be very precise and so on and, and have a, a guided path. But if you have if you're talking of swarms, you want to somehow coordinate depending on what the other stars do and, and there's wind and whatever. So um there, there is already work on that. I, I'm not an expert in this field, but apparently there's some progress also from the community of well, computer science and engineers in this case. Okay. Did you want to, uh, to say something, Caroline, or Dan? Maybe just at the risk of stating the obvious that a swarm is 
I mean, it is a form of a, a network. And so anything we've, you know, the way we've used networks and in, in the case of the brain, they're localized. In the case of the swarm, they're not spatially localized. But still they are a network and they can, you know, emergence can, can come out of their interactions. I mean, this is really superficial. Um, and how to do this experimentally is, is a difficult question. I think we can learn a lot from them, yeah. Yeah, I think we are uh, coming to, to the end of the time that we uh, had scheduled for this round table, but I don't know if any of you have any urgent uh, or any, not urgent, any type of comment, something that you wanted to say, or if Ingo and Claudio wanted to add anything, or... Okay. Just, just, uh, just one comment. Uh, up to now, we have benefiting from the brain to inspire artificial intelligence and artificial neural network and so on. And the question would be, can the brain benefit in the future from this uh, neural network stuff for artificial intelligence to gain insight on how the brain works? Because at the end, we don't know much yet about how it really works. So. Uh, question for instance for Mark, he's very involved and he as well. What do you think about that? I think we already do, yeah. Um, so I, I don't have a completely clear picture, but I think of this, um, well, artificial neural network, which, which uh, won the game of Go against the world champion. And then, I don't know, a, a year later, an advanced AI won completely against that original AI which won the, the world champion. So this is a, a this is a a ping pong between two sides of on the artificial side, but but we can also do that, right? If if we if we have sufficiently advanced technology, it doesn't need to be general AI in some sense. But we can use that for training and, and, and you can argue we do that already um, by 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 taking technology which is reactive to teach us stuff. Like for, there, there are very basic examples. Like if you learn a language, there's a neural network in the background, which would suggest you new task or repeat some, this task, but which is based on neural inspired information processing. So on a very crude level, we do that already. Um, I, I'm not professional enough in that, not expert enough in this field to say what is next, but, but certainly this progressing and um, there's also different initiatives on, on coupling um, AI with real brains. Well, 10 years ago, I've, I've seen rats, be, oh, more than 10 years, rats being steered by remote control, by, by implants, but this was completely remote controlled by humans. Nowadays, they do AI controlled animals, which is, which is a bit weird. But they are working on it, and and I'm sure they will succeed. And at some point, we will have AI co-controlled at least humans. And and if you think about it, we are already dependent on smartphones and whatever pings in our emails, very basic things. So we already have, are extended by technology, and we are interacting with it. And we both learn. We we teach the technology what how to progress. We as human society. And we also learn from it. We also develop, whether it's good or not, but we, we develop in terms of how the other, the technical world develops. We have a, a last question here from the audience, which is for Caroline. <clears throat> it says, what do you mean by computation should be independent from, archi from architecture? Is computation in the brain independent of its architecture? Could you elaborate a little on this? Yes, uh, what I mean is that the computation that is being performed could be performed on a different architecture. So, I mean, could the computation of, you know, what do we do with our brains? We're orienting ourselves, are we doing mathematical computation? And that could be performed on, on well, on digital computations, what not? So it is, it is abstracted and hence independent of the architecture. Um, whereas a computation of structure formation 
is not independent. The, the structure formation of, say, cellular you know, pattern um, has to take place in that molecular environment. It can't take place anywhere else, because otherwise we wouldn't get the structural outcome of that computation. I hope, I hope that clarifies it a little bit. If not, write me an email and I'll be happy to elaborate. Okay, if there are no more comments or questions uh, from any of you, I think we can <clears throat> close now this uh, webinar. Thank you again all the uh, attendees for their participation, uh, the speakers for your inspiring presentations and vivid discussion, and the Institute of Physics for the organization. We have seen that there are many new challenging and interesting aspects that have yet to be understood and explored within this uh, cross-disciplinary research topic. And therefore, I hope that this is not the uh, last, but just uh, the first of a possible series of events in which these things can be uh, discussed and uh, build some type of community for the future. So thanks again, everyone, and uh, see you next time. Thank you. Thank you very Bye -bye. much. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. <clears throat>